Hey, good morning everybody and welcome back to the Aerofric Group. This is Juice and I am sitting here with my cup of coffee and doing a video for you guys uh, about Fighter Alert. This is going to be a two-part series on Fighter Alert operations, uh, how it relates to the real world and how it relates in DCS. And today's episode is part one, considerations from uh, my experiences in the 80s and 90s supporting alert operations with F-15s and F-16s. So grab your cup of coffee, uh, grab your beer, and sit down and enjoy. So a lot of people don't know this about me, but I am not a pilot. I, uh, I'm a pilot, but I'm not a fighter pilot. However, uh, I've been assigned to three fighter organizations and a support role. And uh, so my first role was in the fighter world was at Kadena, F-15s in Okinawa. And we had a permanent assignment to Korea. Uh, uh, it was a TDY assignment, but we were up there for 60 day rotations at a time at Osan, setting alert because the uh, F-4s and the F-16s did not have the power capability of the radar and the weapon systems that the F-15s did. And so we had frontline C models. Our models, our aircraft were probably six to eight months old. Uh, back when I did alert in 1983 and 84 and uh, so we got the job of going up there and sitting alert and so a lot of these pictures you'll see are from my time uh, sitting alert. This is a picture of me standing in front of the jet uh, where we had to go out and uh, in the middle of the night and key the jets with the IFF codes uh, basically to you know have a unique uh, identifier so that they could be picked up on radar and by control and know who's who out there in the world. This is a uh, old school technology, mechanical, had to be done in the nose of the jet, one of the black boxes that we had underneath there. Uh, can't tell you anymore, it's classified. Uh, but first, disclaimer, as I already mentioned, I'm not a fighter pilot. None of us here at the Air Warfare Group are fighter pilots. Uh, most of us here at the Air Warfare Group are aviators, pilots, and uh, have some real world related, uh, inform uh, related experience in the uh, air warfare environment. Um, mine is different than almost all the others, uh, and everybody's unique in the Air Warfare Group. So we have a, a dynamic but uh, diverse uh, group of individuals in the Air Warfare Group. All the photos you're going to see here are taken by me or somebody else with my camera. And uh, so let's move right along. So people ask me, Juice, what was Okinawa like? I said, well, I vaguely remember it because uh, I spent 20 months there total, and I probably spent half of that time away somewhere else. I was either in the Korea, the Philippines, Hawaii, or back in the States for exercises and stuff. Uh, the, it was a great first assignment for me. I was uh, brand new three level when I got there. I got my five level when I left. Uh, before I left, uh, yeah, I was pretty much upgraded within six months. Uh, did my first TDY to Korea, where the, these pictures were taken from. It was uh, December. As a matter of fact, I remember celebrating New Year's Eve Eve because I had to set alert on New Year's Eve, so I went went out. But in Korea, when you go to Santong City, downtown outside the gate at Osan, every night is New Year's Eve. There's bars. You just you, you, There's a bar for every person on the street, or at least there was in the 80s and stuff. For those of you that have been there, done that, you guys know what I'm talking about. So young single guy, Okinawa, going scuba diving and, and snorkeling all the time, uh, cycling around the island. I didn't own a car while I was there. I had friends that had cars that would take us out and do stuff. Uh, this is all of us out. We went out somewhere uh, snorkeling one day, and this is after the snorkel. We we're eating our snacks, eating our lunch, getting ready to go have a beer and go back to the base. So here we are off base. Uh, don't ask me any of these guys' names, but if you are one of these guys in the video that plays DCS, definitely read out, and reach out and shout out at me. I have found friends that I was stationed with uh, years ago through the YouTube channel. So, so I would say that being at Kadena was probably uh, uh, my best choice, uh, which I did not choose. I chose all East Coast bases. And I ended up getting Okinawa, um, which was a, a godsend because I, I'm glad I got to go out and see the world. Uh, I thought I would be in my comfort zone to be stationed back at home, you know, anywhere from North Carolina down to Louisiana. And lo and behold, I get Okinawa, which was pretty cool. So at Kadena, we, like I said, we were never there. This is a picture of me and one of my crew chief friends. Uh, here we are deployed to the Philippines. We're at Clark Air Base on the ramp there. Uh, really awesome jet, the F-15C. I wish DCS World would make a C model. I know they're the F-15E mud hands coming out, but I wish they had a full functional C model air superiority fighter. That would be awesome. You know, you know, have, it wouldn't be something that's modern and up to date with the current avionics and weapon suite or capabilities, but it would be neat to have an F-15C that was not FC-3. 
So of the 20 months assigned to Kadena, uh, here's some of the things that I got involved with. I got to go to Combat Sage, which is a live fire missile shot uh, missile shot exercise. It, it's actually designed to uh, allow aviators to get skills, the buttonology and the switchology to get the weapons armed to, you know, effectively confirm their training and, and, and go from the, uh, from the master arm uh, off safe to actually the kill of the target. And we would shoot at, uh, our guys would shoot at Q-34B drones, I believe it was, the little, uh, the little B drones, B-E-E. Um, and uh, we would go out and shoot the missiles, and it was also a two twofold mission. We also got to test certain lots. The Air Force would pull out. Okay, we got this, you know, this many AIM sevens, this many AIM nines. Let's go out and shoot a couple of them, make sure they're still working. You know, if they have a, a failure rate out of, let's say, they go out and shoot 20 missiles, they have a failure rate of 50 percent, then they might need to go look at that whole lot of missile or replace it. You know, it may have a reliability issue. So it was kind of a twofold purpose for that mission. So this is where this picture is taken from. Uh, one of my friends got an incentive flight in the uh, F-15 in the backseat of a D model. So I sent him up with my Minolta X-700, which I bought in Japan. Uh, when you get stationed in Japan, you go out and buy camera equipment and stereo stuff. That was our big thing to do. So I went to Team Spirit in Korea where we bought all our mink blankets. <laughs> and uh, Team Spirit is kind of a multinational uh, Korean exercise, Korean Peninsula exercise, where the Army, Navy, the Air Force, and Marines all team up together with the, the South Koreans and do this joint exercise as a show of force and also to be prepared for an invasion from the north. Cope Thunder, back down to the Philippines. Now, Cope Thunder is kind of like the... Uh, Pacific version of Red Flag, and it's a multi-force, multi-unit uh, exercise that integrates all the people uh, rescue, uh, AIC or inter air intercept control through AWACS, ground control, uh, fighters, seed, cap, everything, uh, strike. It's uh, it's a pretty cool exercise. It's basically like a smaller version of a Red Flag exercise. I was lucky enough to be selected for William Tell in 1984. I went to uh, TDY. We flew in 30 minutes. We flew from Okinawa to Florida. Uh, that was 30 minutes on the calendar. It took uh, 15 hours and 30 minutes in the air with the KC-10 Dragon 6 F-15s across over, over the Sea of Japan, through the Aleutian Islands, uh, down through Canada and into Florida in 15 and a half hours. And uh, talk, about, uh, talk about extreme flight time. Our pilots were whipped after that. Uh, we had multiple ORI exercises. ORI stands for Operational Readiness Inspection. We even had one exercise where we picked up and actually moved. We took uh, our aircraft and all our support equipment and people and went to Kwanju Air Base in Korea uh, and spent eight days there conducting exercise just like if we really uh, got up and left. Uh, it was an exercise. It wasn't a, a full deployment for like war, but it, it helped us exercise the logistics ability of being able to make sure that we had everything. And, and it, you know what? If you go there unprepared, you at least learn lessons like, hey, we need to bring more of this next time. We need to bring more of that. We don't need to bring this as much, you know, stuff like that. So I mentioned in a video before about the KAL-0 Korean Airlines Air 007 shoot down on September 1st, 1983. I was not qualified to go TDY at the time, but they came in at our shop and said, we need two people ready to go in 30 minutes. And we always had our bags packed. We always had our mobility bags, our alert bags packed. And I didn't get a go on it, but my uh, squadron mates did get, a go, did get to go. And we went up and, and actually, uh, actually set alert while they searched for the black boxes. So if you Google search, Kadena's role in the KAL-00 shoot down the hunt for the black boxes, you'll see what we did there and you'll see our jets, our red tails, the 67th Fighter Squadron. Uh, did uh, on As we went to William Tell, we did that for a month in Florida and then we got a week and a half of exercises, at, part of a red flag exercise in uh, at Nellis in Nevada. And so we actually went from, ok uh, from Okinawa to Florida, 30 days in Florida, and then we went and after our 30 days TDY in Florida with a lot of partying and a lot of girls, we went to um, to Nellis. And so we, we got, you know, to go down and do some exercises with that and work on the Nellis ramp. That was my first and uh, only real red flag that I was part of. I've uh, been to Nellis for other things uh, multiple times since then. But again, this was a, a great experience. This is where I first got to see ACMI, or Air, Co Air Combat Maneuvering and Instrumentation, uh, what we call uh, basically what TACView is for us. ACMI is the, uh, the screens with a two-dimensional. You know, this was before Top Gun, before uh, Charlie says the, 
the aircraft does a split S, that's the wrong thing you want to do. And they, they show you briefly what ACMI used to look like. That's exactly what it looked like in my day. It was very, art we called it the Atari system. <laughs> it was kind of like a video game. So if you guys have any experience with ACMI and stuff like that, and you remember how the evolution of the ACMI is coming along, uh, feel free to share any comments. Just don't say anything classified or we'll have to kill you. Uh, and then I mentioned the F-15 Alert FOL. FOL stands for Forward Operating Location, and this was a permanent assignment for us where we had TDY forces maintaining our alert up at Osan uh, because we were the tip of the spear uh, if, the, uh, if the aircraft crossed the DMZ coming south towards Seoul and towards the rest of the rest of the peninsula. Uh, it was no it was no uh, no question why the my squadron, the 67th Fighter Squadron. Uh, along with the other two squadrons, the 44th Vampires and the 12th Eagles uh, at Kadena at the time, won the Hughes Trophy, which is now called the Raytheon Trophy. If you guys want to do more research on that, Google the Hughes Trophy and also check out the Raytheon Trophy. There's a ton of videos on the recent Raytheon Trophy winners. And the Raytheon Trophy is what they used to call the Hughes Trophy before Hughes Aircraft Corporation was sold to Raytheon. So. Excuse me. So the uh, the Raytheon Trophy is an award to the best air air superiority squadron uh, in the Air Force, and our unit, uh, our the 18th wing at Kadena, won it three years consecutively. We we're the first wing to wear win it three years in a row, and I believe to this date it might be a tie, but I know the 67th, my squadron, has won it more times than any other squadron. I, we've could have been surpassed by the Grim Reapers up in England. But uh, don't quote me on that. It's just that I know that as of about five years ago, we were the most winning squadron. The criteria for this award are many. Uh, it has to do with how many sorties you generate, uh, how many real-world deployments you go to, uh, how, many, uh, how many exercises you participate in. It's, it's an awards package. You basically put it together and, and, and submit against all the other air-to-air -air squadrons that submit a package, and the winner gets selected. So I mentioned fighter alert. So we would go up and I would sit for 60 days at a time. Uh, you know, I got days off every now and then. We had some rotational shifts and stuff. But we used to, you know, we would sit up there and wait for the horn to go off. And our jets were what we called hot cocked alert. And a warning, do not Google hot cocked. Uh, on your computer if you're at work right now. Uh, make, wait until you get home to do that. You might want to just wait for that. Uh, make sure you're in a private browser too. But we'd have the jets that were hot cocked ready, which means that most of the safety devices on the jet were removed. They were ready to launch. You'll notice in this picture here, this airplane's on alert, the ladder's on there, but you'll notice there's no streamers or pins on the ejection seat. There's nothing covering the pedo covers on the ACES-2 ejection seat pedo covers on the parachute. Uh, there's nothing covering the HUD glass. Normally when these airplanes are set parked, They've got all kinds of protection from the sun and from the dust and dirt and the rain, and ours had none of that. Uh, we did have a few things you'll see a little bit later, but just basically gear safety pins and weapon pylon safety pins. Anywhere there was an explosive or something that could collapse on taxi, they were safetyed. Even the canopy strut that holds the canopy up was not uh, in, in place, and sometimes the maintenance crews would have to go out and charge the bottle, the, the pneumatic bottle that kept the canopy open. Uh, you know, recharge. They would go out and we'd run the jets, uh, you know, every couple of days to keep the engine warm or to keep the uh, oil uh, lubrication good in the engine, but would also recharge the hydraulic system so that they would basically hold the canopy up while they're on alert. We're in these hardened aircraft shelters. Uh, they're basically uh, concrete covered uh, shelters like you see in DCS World, all very, very similar. Uh, same ones we had in, at Kunsan. Uh, all these have probably been replaced with more modern shelters right now, but pretty much they're sitting in these shelters with the doors open, ready to taxi out, and we're just, uh, we're just you know, a few feet away in a building with a van. We run out there, we, you know, flash the guard our code of the day, and they, they wave us through because the horn's going off, and they've been, they've been told that an alert, alert has been launched. Uh, and we, I tell you what, we did this in exercise more than we did in real world there, you know, and that's, that was the name of the game is being ready to deter uh, an aggression act from the North Korea. So our weapons complement on the C models in the 80s were four AIM-9 Limas, I believe, and, and I've, the dates match up on the Lima production uh, and use. And uh, I remember, I, I definitely don't think they were Papas. They might have been Papas, but they definitely weren't mics, and they sure as hell weren't X-rays. X-rays hadn't been invented yet. And then on the AIM-7, or the, the radar-guided missiles, we had AIM-7 mics, uh, four, and this was the 4x4, uh, and gun 
complement that we had in there. You can see that we're up there on alert, but this is one of the 44th Vampire Jets. A little shout out to the Vampire fans out there. Uh, go Bats! And finally, you had the M61 Vulcan Cannon. I don't know if this was the A1, A2, or A, uh, A whatever. Uh, if you guys know what was probably the most dominant gun on the F-15 in 1983 on the C models that were brand new, uh, let me know. And of course, it was loaded with a full full rack of uh, full canister of uh, 20 millimeter, uh, the appropriate uh, you know, armor piercing incendiary or whatever they had at the time. I just know that it probably was not TGP, which is target practice rounds, which is what we flew around in. Our jets flew around in those uh, most of the time. And for those of you that are not familiar with uh, jets, these jets, when they fly out, the gun, unless they're actually going to do an alert or a live fire exercise, the gun is pinned for safety. Um, it basically will not spin, it will not engage, so the, the pilot can pull the trigger, but it will not shoot because it ca has to start spinning that Gatling gun. If you've ever seen a gal uh, fire off a helicopter or the A-10, it has to start rotating before the bullets can cycle through. And uh, so our guns were pinned and our jets flew around with a partial complement of target practice rounds just for the weight. And we also flew around with like a Cap Aim 9 with a seeker head. So you could still use the seeker head, but there was no rocket motor. Uh, just like our Cap Aim 9. And that's, if you see a lot of the uh, Air Warfare Group videos when we're doing training, we fly around with the training munitions as much as possible. We only use the live stuff when we're actually doing live fire stuff. Uh, it's part of the realism immersion that we're trying to do. And thanks to DCS for coming out with the training munitions uh, for the F-18. I hope that we get a full complement of training Mavericks, training JDAMs, everything that we can put on there. Fly for the weight. I'd like it to make it if the, so that we could release it or jettison it, but it does not, you know, you can't arm it or, or punch it like it's a weapon. I'd like to have it just jettisonable, but not, you know, so people can still use it for the weight training. Uh, going along, this is one of the pictures. You'll see us all lined up here. This is not an alert picture. This is us deployed for one of the Cope Thunders or Combat Sages. That's my squadron commander, uh, now retired uh, full full star four star general uh, uh, Speedy. Uh, uh, his name escapes me for now. Uh, if you look up Speedy, he was my squadron commander in the 67th. Knew him well. Really great guy. The guy over on with his back to us to the right. That's uh, Greg Roos. Greg was uh, Greg retired uh, out of Mountain Home, I believe. Uh, Greg was my buddy, and he's the guy that got the incentive flight. So I sent him up with my camera to, during the live fire live, live fire exercise. So this was probably Combat Sage when we were down there for Combat Sage. This is uh, this is another shot with the mountains. Uh, Clark Air Base was shut down. Uh, not too long after this, maybe five to eight years after this, they had Mount Pitatubo blew up in the early 90s and shut the base down for a while, but I think they were running operations out of Clark Angeles City, the Philippines now. Subic Bay was also open at this time, so we had Navy down there, but uh, this is pretty much, uh, this is just a TDY shot. Really fun place to be. Um, you know, like I said, we were hardly ever at Kadena. So before you guys go, just want to ask you to consider subscribing. We have we noticed that uh, just a little bit less than half of our viewers are not subscribers. Uh, but if you guys subscribe, it really helps the YouTube algorithm to get our videos out there. We're not we're not doing this for profit. We're not doing advertising. We're not trying to uh, to make you watch videos to watch our videos. Uh, we love your comments. I, I literally I love all the comments, uh, positive or negative, just because I want to reward the people for contributing. That's what this channel is all about. Is making making DCS as a community better uh, and sharing real world experiences. Um, Tyro, Takeda, myself, and all the others uh, that I will not name at this time uh, have done a lot of stuff in the real world related to aviation and military and we, uh, we, we take that and pull that together for experience for you guys. Uh, like it or dislike it, doesn't make a difference to us. If you dislike something, tell us why you don't like it. We would like to work on that. And then share it. If you find this valuable, share it with a friend. Definitely the next one because uh, part two is going to be about um, it's going to be about setting up a DCS alert posture with your mission editor. And I'll go into that in detail of some of the things you want to consider. And I'll show you some of the common mistakes people make when they get into DCS world. And they overload the airplane uh, and it's not as capable. Uh, and another thing that they do is punch those tanks. You guys know me. I'm a tank Nazi. Uh, don't forget to turn on your taxi light. I hope you guys like this video. And everybody, be safe out there. Uh, Want to, want to make sure that you guys are enjoying DCS, but also uh, having enriched lives and enjoying life in general, because I know I am. Cheers, everybody. Take care.